So you want dependent types. Maybe you've heard that Calc is good for automating proofs, but maybe you've also heard that it can make pattern matching kind of awkward. So in this talk, we'll have a look at some techniques for dealing with pattern matching in Calc. But first, let's have a look at some Agda. This will just give us a nice clear view of what we're missing in Calc. So we define the type of natural numbers and like GADTs in Haskell, we give the full type of each constructor. This set is just a primitive kind of ordinary data types. We define the type of vectors or length index lists. These are parameterized by a type alpha and indexed by a natural number. And the way we set this up, this index reflects the length of the vector in its type. So we define nil to have length zero and we define cons or this infix comma to have length suck of m where m is the length of the tail. These curly braces mean that we're defining this argument m to be an implicit argument because we expect that Agda will be able to infer this value in most contexts. Our main example is the zip function, which takes arguments x's and y's, both vectors of length n, applies a function to their respective elements to construct a result vector also length n. Now the interesting thing here is that when we pattern match on one of these vectors, we refine its type, in particular its length index, based on which constructor we actually matched. So when x is nil, we know that nil always constructs a vector of length zero. So n must be zero here, and indeed zero everywhere. Because nil is the only, only construct that gives a vector of length zero, this means that y's must also be nil. So we don't even see cases for cons and nil, or nil and cons. And of course, when we return nil here, it has just the right type for our result. We can tell a similar story for the cons case. When x is cons, then n must be suck of m, y's must also be cons, and m is the length of the tail of x's and, and y's. So this recursive call also has length m, and the vector we construct here has length suck m, which is just the right type for our result. All of this is mediated by this argument n, and because this is an implicit argument, we don't even have to see its value in our patterns. Agda just works out what this value must be behind the scenes. So Agda makes this all very easy. Cop has some different ideas. Cop just has a match expression, like case in Haskell, where we match an expression E against its possible constructor C. But Cock also has these optional annotations as, in, and return, which allows us to tell Cock how we would like it to refine the result type of the match based on what we learn when we match a particular constructor. The idea is that we have two slightly different procedures for determining the result type of the match, depending on whether we're looking at the match expression as a whole, or whether we're looking at the type of a particular branch of the match. The idea is that different branches can have different result types, but when an expression does match a particular constructor, then the two procedures will give types that are compatible. We'll get into the details with some examples. So here in COP, we define the natural numbers and the vectors in exactly the same way. We set up some implicit arguments, and we'll skip over some things we'll come back to later. So now let's try to define our zip function. I'm going to use the refine tactic, which allows us to write pure terms with holes in them. Or we can have COP tell us the types of what we, the things we have in our context and the types of the things we need to build to fill in the holes. This blue region tells us where COP is up to, so what we see here is just the single hole created by the declaration of the zip function. You can see I've already given a return annotation here which just repeats the result type of the function. The reason for this is that otherwise, COP would try to infer some match annotations, but since our purpose here is to learn how to write these annotations ourselves, I'll just disable that inference by giving a return annotation. Now, if we try to begin as we did in Agda by just matching on X's and Y's together, we run into our first problem. And that's that COP always expects an exhaustive pattern match. So it wants a nil cons case as well as a cons nil case, even though we know those cases don't make sense. I can try to write, a, well, I can, can write a wildcard pattern which covers both of those cases. And as we can see, COT expands that out into all four cases. But we can see this 
In the nil-nil case, we can see this strange y is zero. The reason for this is that when we match on multiple things in COG, it's just syntax sugar for a bunch of nested matches. So this y is zero is just an artifact of the desugaring, which happens before type checking. So this gets ugly fairly quickly. So I'm just going to give in and match one thing at a time. So now we just have two cases. In the nil case, we can see our next problem, which is that Koch wants us to return a vector of length n for some arbitrary n, even though we know that in the nil case, this n should really be zero. In fact, if I try to say nil here, it's rejected. So we need to refine the result type of the match based on what we learn when we match a particular constructor. The way we do this is with an in annotation. So now we have access to these two procedures to type the match. When we look at the type of the match as a whole, we take the actual type of x's, which is vec a n, and match that against this pattern here. So j gets bound to n, and then j becomes available in the return annotation. And since j is bound to n, we can change this n to a j without changing the type of the overall match. And indeed, we can see that it still turns blue. But now when we're looking at the branch, we don't use the actual type of x's, we use the type of this constructor expression. As we, as we recall, nil always produces a vector of length zero. So in this case, j is bound to zero. And the type we need to return is vec c of zero, which is what we see down here. So now we can say nil and move on to the const case. So in the const case, we use this constructor expression const p x x t. So m is bound to p and the result type will be vec a s of p. So j is bound to s of p and we need to return a vec c of s of p, which is what we see down here. So to do this, we're going to need to pull apart y's. So let's match on y's. We need exhaustive pattern matches. Now I want to write a return annotation here. Uh, and because we're still in the const branch of the outer match, this will be a vec c of s of p. So now we're looking at this nil case. We know this case doesn't make sense because if x's is nil, then y, so x's is cons, then y's must also be cons. But Cox still wants us to return a vec of length s of p. We don't yet have the tools to deal with this, so I'll just admit this case for now and move on to the cons case. So in the cons case, we have the head and the tail of x's and we have the head and the tail of y's. So maybe we can just build our result. But Koch rejects this, and if we make this a whole, we can see why. The tail of y's has length q, but the recursive call is expecting a vector of length p. Now you and I know that p and q must be the same because p comes from the length of x's and q comes from the length of y's, and we know that x's and y's have the same length. But we haven't convinced the type checker. And in fact, we have no evidence in our context here of the relationship between p and q. We don't even know the relationship between q and n. Somehow we need to recover this relationship. And the way we can do this is by extending the return annotation in the inner match with some evidence of the relationship between things outside the match and things inside the match. In particular, we want to recover evidence that the length of x's is the same as the length of y's. In the const branch of the outer match, we know that the length of x, x's is s of p. So we want to know that that's the same as j, where j is the length of y's. So now our return annotation here has a function type, so we're going to receive this evidence as an argument in each branch. We're going to have to pass this evidence in from outside the match, but I'll just leave that as a hole to fill in later. So now returning to the const case, 
we can see that the tail of y still has length q and we need something of length p, but now we have some evidence that we can use. So for now I'm just going to use an inversion tactic, which will rewrite the type of the tail of y's, so we can just use it to fill in the hole. But now we need to come up with the actual evidence that s of p is equal to n. And again we're stuck because we have nothing in our context to show the relationship between n and p. You and I know that this must be true, because n is the length of x's and we know that p comes from the cons constructor for x's but we haven't convinced the type checker. So where did this n come from? Well, when we look at the type of the inner match, j comes from the type of y's, and y's is bound all the way up here, so it has length n. So for the whole match, j is bound to n, and this argument type in the return annotation is s of p equals n. Of course, that's the type of this whole. Now, this s of p just comes straight from here, but the reason we used S of P is because we know it's the length of X's in the cons branch of the outer match. And in this branch, this in annotation refines this J to S of P. So perhaps this is exactly where we need to refine the type of Y's from N to S of P. In fact, we can do that quite easily by just deferring the introduction of Y's so that its type appears in the return annotation. Now we'll receive Y's in each branch of the outer match. And when we return to our hole down here, the, the equality we need to prove is now trivial. The n has been refined to s of p, and we can just say eek refl here. So now all that remains is to fill in this bogus nil case. And we can see that the work we've done in the cons branch has actually given us a hypothesis that s of p is equal to zero. Of course, this is a false hypothesis, and from a false hypothesis we can prove anything. In fact, inversion will do the job here as well. So, there's a complete definition of the zip function, but I actually want to get rid of these inversion tactics, because learning how to write these inversions ourselves will teach us another couple of tricks. So let's look at this one first. Here we have evidence that s of p is equal to s of q, and we want to convert a vector of length q into a vector of length p. So that's what our suck rewrite function here is going to do. I've abstracted over the vec b with some arbitrary t, which is indexed by a natural number. We receive evidence that s of m is equal to s of n, and I want to convert a t of n into a t of m. To understand how this is going to work, we're not going to need to look at how equality is defined. So there's nothing magical about equality, it's just an inductive definition, which is implicitly parameterized by type A, and explicitly parameterized by a value x of type A, and also indexed by another value of type A. It's just a single constructor which takes no arguments, but we can only use the equal constructor in a context where the type checker can see that the index is in fact identical to the parameter. We have some syntax sugar here, so we can just use the equality sign. So the thing on the left of the equal sign will be the parameter, and the thing on the right of the equal sign will be the index. Now there's no informational content in the equal constructor, so it's all about the types, which means we're not going to get very far without an in annotation. Now when we look at the type of the match expression as a whole, j comes from the type of h, so j is bound to s of n. But we want to talk about things with just an n, so to get under that s constructor, we're actually going to have to match on that j inside the return annotation. I haven't changed anything yet because I've just used the same type everywhere. But again, when we look at the type of the match as a whole, j is bound to s of n, which matches with s of i. So i is bound to n, which means we should be able to change this n to an i without affecting the type of the overall match. Indeed, we can see that it still turns blue. And now when we look at the type of the branch, 
We don't use the actual type of H, we use the type of the egrefel constructor. So J is bound to this X, but X is just the parameter to the equality type, which is the thing on the left of the equal sign. So in the branch, J is bound to S of M, which matches with S of I, so I is bound to M, and the type we, we end up with is T of M to T of M, which is what we see down here. Of course, that's easy, that's just the identity function. Okay, so that's a complete definition of suck rewrite, but it's interesting to note that this zero branch in the match annotation is completely irrelevant. It's actually useful to use an empty type here to document that it's irrelevant. So now we have what we need to fill in this hole. We just want to use suck rewrite with our evidence to rewrite the type of the tail of wires, and that should deal with this case. Right. So now looking at the nil case here, we're going to receive evidence that S of P is equal to zero, and we just want to construct something that would normally be impossible. So that's what our nat discrimination function here is going to do. We have some arbitrary type T of which we know about which we know nothing. We receive some bogus evidence that S of M is equal to zero. We just want to return a value of that arbitrary type T. As usual, we won't get far without an in annotation. And again, I'm going to match on that J inside the return annotation. Again, I haven't changed anything yet because I've just used T everywhere, but when we look at the type of the match as a whole, J will be bound to zero, which matches with this first case. So this is what determines the type of the overall match. And in fact, if I say unit here, it's rejected. Of course, that means that this other branch is, is not relevant to the type of the match as a whole. So I can say whatever I like here. If I say unit, then when we look at the branch, J comes from the type of the equal constructor, so J is bound to this X, where X is the thing on the left of the equal sign, which is S of M. So the type of the branch is unit, and that's what we see down here. Of course, that's easy. We can just say TT, which is the constructor of the unit type. So what just happened? Remember when we said that when an, when an expression does actually match a constructor, then these two procedures will give us types that are compatible. But conversely, we can also say that when the types of these two procedures are incompatible, and it's giving us the assurance that this expression cannot actually match with this constructor. And since eGreffel is the only constructor, what we essentially have here is constructive proof that there is no such H. This type is uninhabited. Of course, we already knew, knew that, we just had needed to prove it. Okay, so now we have what we need to fill in this hole. So I can just replace all of this with a nat discrimination. And that should take care of this case. Indeed, there we have just a pure term for implementing our zip function. But clearly, this is not particularly nice. There's a lot of noise, and I think we've lost sight of the fact that we're working down these two vectors in parallel. So it's a good time to step back and think about what we're missing here, whether there's some pattern matching behavior we would have liked to have had, and whether we can somehow recover that behavior. And what we're missing is this. When we have a vector that we know has length at least one, so it has length S of P for some P, then we ought to be able to get at the head and the tail of that vector without having to deal with this bogus nil case, without having to rewrite the type of the tail, Tail should just come out with length p. Okay, so here's a function which implements that behavior. Given a vector of length s of m, just give us back its parts. So as usual, we're not going to get very far without an in annotation. So this is a vector. And again, we have a vector of length s of m, but we want to talk about things of just, of just m. So again, we're going to have to match 
on that J in our return annotation. Again, I haven't changed anything yet because I've just used the same type everywhere. When we look at the type of the match as a whole, J will be bound to S of M, which matches with S of I. So we should be able to change this M to an I without affecting the type of the overall match. Indeed, we can see it still turns blue. Of course, that means that this zero branch is not relevant to the type of the whole match. So we can change this to something convenient, like unit. Now, when we look at the nil case, J will come from the type of the nil constructor, so J will be zero. And so we need to return something of type unit. That's what we see down here. Of course, that's easy. And we can move on to the const case. Now, for the const case, J will be bound to S of P, which matches with S of I. So we need to return something of type A cross VEC A P, which is what we see down here. Of course, we have exactly what we need to construct that, so we just make a pair. And we're done. So now we have exactly what we need to make a slightly more sensible zip function. And now because I want to retain this sense that we're working down these vectors in parallel, rather than matching on x's and then refining the type of y's, I'm going to match on n and then refine the types of X's and Y's together. So what I want to say is something along the lines of return a vec A of N to vec B of N to vec C of N. But this isn't, isn't quite right yet because I want these N's to refine according to the value of this N. So I need a variable here that will, will do that refinement for us. But I'm not interested in the type of n, n is just a nat. I'm interested in its value. So instead of an in annotation, I'll use an as annotation. So this just takes the value of this expression and binds it to j. And then j becomes available in the return annotation. So we can change all of these j's, all of these n's to j's. And now when we look at the type of the match as a whole, j is bound to n, so we have the same type here as we have up here. But when we look at the zero branch, j is bound to the actual value zero. And so what we have in this case, we're given vectors of length zero and we need to return a vector of length zero. Of course, that's easy. We just say nil. Then in the s case, j is bound to s of p. We're given vectors of length s of p. We need to return a vector of length s of p. So now we can use our unconst function on both of those vectors. Pull out the components and build our result. And we're done. And now, because you're all experts, you're allowed to use the actual match annotation inference on those occasions where it works. So we can just delete this entire annotation. And we can see that COP has actually inferred exactly what we wrote before, with just some slight renaming. Okay, so we're not quite as elegant as the actor, but I think this is not completely horrible. We have at least retained the sense that we're working down these vectors x's and y's in parallel. So let's just quickly review what we've learned. We have a match expression with annotations which allow us to de determine the return type of the match according to what we learn when we match a particular constructor. When we're typing the whole match, we take the value of E and bind it to V and its type and match that against this pattern here to obtain V and I and then RVI will give us the type of the match as a whole. For each branch, we do the same thing, but rather than using E, we use the actual constructor expression. Some problems that we come up against. First of all, we find that a pattern match only refines its return type. It won't refine the types of things already in scope. And so it's often necessary to defer the introduction of arguments so their types appear in return annotations. Sometimes that's not possible. For example, if something comes into scope in an outer match, 
then we may need to explicitly thread that thing or some evidence about that thing through the return annotation in an inner match. Adam Tapala calls this the convoy pattern. Another thing is that pattern matches must always be exhaustive, even when some cases don't make sense. And the way we deal with this is by matching on type indices in the return annotation to convert those nonsense cases to some trivial type like unit. And finally, it's always worth thinking about what pattern matching behavior we would like to have and whether we can write some functions that provide that behavior.